So hello to all of our panelists. Thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this conversation. You know, what we know is diversity and inclusion, diversity, equity, and inclusion is top of mind globally for all companies, for all HR leaders, and how we are advancing that, that culture and thinking about it from engaging with our employees in their own experiences. So we wanna hear from all of you today. We wanna to hear your thought leadership on several different topics. And we have some great questions and we hope that our, all of our attendees really enjoy it. But before we do that, I wanna introduce myself. Again, I'm Tracy Wade. I'm the Vice President and Global Head of Oracle Corporation. And then I'm gonna ask each of our panelists just to start by introducing themselves. And Mara, because we didn't have an opportunity to connect directly, I would love to just start with you. If you could give a quick introduction of yourself. Thank you, Tracy, and uh, thank you, everybody. Yes, my name is Mara Zavagno. I'm Italian, based in Dusseldorf, and I'm working for Kone Cranes, which is uh, uh, a Finnish headquarter company, and my role is uh, Global HR for Talent Engagement Rewards and Diversity and Inclusion. And diversity, equity, and inclusion is definitely my passion. Thank you. Hi, Tracy. Nice to meet you. So, um, and hi, everyone. I'm Tobias Julen. I serve as the Chief People Officer at Tanium. I'm leading a highly talented team there. Um, before Tanium, I was Vice President HR at Ericsson, and before that, a few years of consulting at Deloitte. Just a quick interaction with Tanium, because it's a well-kept secret. It's the industry's only provider of a what we call converged endpoint management. In essence, what that is, we tie together endpoint workflows, operation, risk, um, IT into a single platform to uh, deliver comprehensive cybersecurity. So we serve a majority of the Fortune 100 companies, as well as all five branches of the US Armed Forces, governments, major companies around the world. We're uh, named on the Forbes Cloud 100 list for six consecutive years, and this year we actually made the uh, Fortune 100 best list as well. So it's a great place to work, and, and I would say a lot of that is down to diversity and inclusion work that we do. Hi, everyone. I'm Lisa smith Strother, and I'm the Global Head of Employer and diversity brand at Relics. And for those of you who don't know, Relics is a global um, decision tool, information analytics firm. Some of our companies are Elsevier and LexisNexis. We have four business divisions and uh, have about 30,000 employees. The reason I mentioned the employees, my role as the head of employer and diversity uh, branding is to try to stitch together the diversity message, the diversity talent acquisition, all of it together so that the, the candidate can understand a more, uh, I'd say the cumulative value uh, of, of the company. So uh, very happy to be here and looking forward to being on the panel. Hello everyone, my name's David Doe. I'm the Vice President of Talent Strategy and Excellence at Shell. I won't explain what Shell does because I think most people know uh, the company. <laughs> um, but what I will say is that Powering Lives is part of our uh, Powering Progress strategy. And part of Powering Lives is about making Shell one of the world's most diverse and inclusive employers in the world. And I'm very passionate to talk to you today a little bit about that journey uh, and look forward to interacting with you. Hi, everyone. So my name is Eric Plu. I'm the head of HR for Region EMEA at SCT. And SCT is, it is a global health and hygiene company uh, headquartered in Stockholm in Sweden. And I'm definitely deeply involved into the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion topic. So my passion, reason why I'm here today. Excellent. Thank you. And you're in for a treat because this is going to be a real discussion, right? And I encourage all of the panelists to kind of build on each other, you know, jump in. This is going to be a real dialogue, an opportunity to really be seat, kind of seated in on this personal discussion you feel like we're going to have now. And I want to just start with you, Tobias. Um, you know, as we're thinking about building a culture of equity and, you know, think about diversity and inclusion within a hybrid model, there's a lot of data out there that's saying, you know, working from a hybrid model, some individuals are being left behind because perhaps, um, they, you know, they are not as extroverted, don't, don't speak up as much. And, and we're trying to, you know, how do we balance this whole opportunity in this hybrid work model where people are, some people are in the office now and some people are online, that they're, have, they're not forgotten, right? And that the people who are in the office aren't just, you know, there and they've got the more visibility. How do we balance that, Tobias? I'd love to learn, um, put that question to you and see what your thoughts are. 
Thank you, Tracy. It's, it's a really great question. It's it's one that we've been considering a lot. So, um, but I would, and, and we do a lot. So I'm, I'm sorry if this is going to be a long, long answer. Um, but I would stop by flipping around. Actually, I would say that we, we owe our culture and our values and our success to our people. So our success story is really rooted in the diversity of the experience, the backgrounds of all the people that work for us. And it's, it's everything we've done differently to make Tainu a world-class company. Um, and, and to start with that, I mean, what we do is make sure that every member of our EG team sets uh, goals uh, and commitments to diversity, inclusion, equity, belonging into the team goals. Um, then, of course, what we do, we also do different things to support our employees in, in various ways. So uh, what do we do? We, we sponsor courses that improve diversity in the workplace. Um, we host, uh, we have actually a, a series of speakers that we host and they feature leaders from different diverse backgrounds who we believe demonstrate our core value of being unstoppable. And, and they come in and they talk about different things that they've done and to, to encourage and, and drive that within our company. We've also done things like internal training, internal content, which is really designed to support our team members in understanding the important role they play in creating a welcoming and inclusive environment where really everybody feels they have opportunity to succeed and grow. And then, of course, we do things like celebrating events. We, we celebrate Pride this month, of course. Uh, International Women's Day, we celebrate Veterans Day, AAPI Month, Black History Month, and more of these things. And we do that really through spotlighting our employees and coming together for celebrations, giving back, and educating ourselves through different resources. The other thing we do is whenever somebody joined, so every every new hire we bring in, they're welcome into all the existing employee engagement initiatives we have. We have new hire orientations that bring them in. They're encouraged to participate. They and especially during our first few weeks. And the same thing goes with our internship programs. We just brought on 65 interns who were taken through 10 weeks of internship with us, and they are extremely engaged and extremely driven and a really diverse background. And we're so happy to have them here. But I want to reflect the last thing you said, which is really important as well, which is about not leaving anybody behind. So we have been, even before the pandemic, a, a very remote company. When the pandemic started, we became very firmly a remote first company. And what we mean by that is that remote is the norm. So while we offer a hybrid working environment, everything is built on people being remote. Diversity, inclusion, and, and equity, and belonging is part of that. So what we do is we actually have different Slack channels, for example that we are tying to office locations or regional locations. And they host things like weekly trivia, they spotlight regional events that we do, and they invite employees to come into office days if they're interested. They essentially give employees a platform to connect with other team members that live near them, which ensures that we cater to a globally distributed remote first workforce and still allow them to meet up and provide opportunities to connect with both remote and in-person team members. So. We really feel that we, we need to keep people involved, belonged. And, and the results we get in our engagement service prove that we must be doing something right. I really think that what Tobias shares really builds on to the next question regarding the leaders how and the employee experience. Uh, you know, you see with Tobias' organization, they're looking at a well-rounded, high-touch approach of every way to, to put tentacles out there and touch um, everyone. Employee experience is so critical and the business leader setting the pace for that culture is, is important as well. That employees know it's safe enough in their organizations to think about social responsibility, being actively engaged, um, including, you know, think about how the progress of d is within the organization. How are you and, you know, how do you use d to improve employee experience within your company? Right, and, and thank you so much. And you're right, I mean, employee experience is an important driver of, an engagement, of course, is an important driver of our employer brand because if our employees feel fully engaged and are participating, obviously that speaks volumes for our overall attractiveness, right? So we do have a DNI council and a very highly engaged and active ERG network. Some of our ERGs actually have bi-weekly happy hour sessions where every topic is covered from the, I'll say the frivolous and fun to more um, more engaging and um, sort of relevant topics and all in an effort to support that open and supportive environment. And uh, they have often have guest speakers um, that to really bring people in and to, to add value. And from a diversity branding perspective, which impacts our, 
our employee experience and engagement. Uh, we also recognize, like Tobias referenced, a host of diversity and United Nation days, where we actually serve up suggested branded content and creative templates for employees to share, because that gets them highly involved and, and participating. Oftentimes, these, these templates will have um, service frames for employees to insert themselves in, where they can sort of take over uh, the, the brand message, if you will, and insert themselves into that. Um, and in addition to that, I, I think Tobias mentioned International Women's Day, but there are a host of diversity days. We recognize over 30 of them because we see this as an expression and a reflection of our culture, and it helps our employees sort of identify uh, with that as well. And it also helps them serve as thought leaders as it relates to, uh, to diversity. We also think that um, the training is, is critically important. So we have unconscious bias, we have psychological safety uh, programs, those of you that are familiar with uh, Amy Edmondson's program. So we leverage that a lot. We also have launched uh, inclusive interview training sessions to help people have a, a broader understanding and enlighten them as far as what's appropriate uh, to ask. We've committed and invested in several diversity and racial justice programs um, in an effort to show our commitment as well and our leaders play an active part uh, in that. Uh, we've also launched allyship programs addressing the various categories of, of the diversity dimensions. And part of that includes training and certification programs where upon completion, employees will get badges for them to share across social media because we see all of this as an opportunity for employees to serve as really social, social media advocates, if you will, um, recognizing that in many of their followers, 80 to 90% aren't even uh, following our companies Keep in mind, we have four distinct business divisions with their own visual and verbal identities. So by sharing them with branded content for each of these divisions, it really helps the employees feel much more involved. And we, we uh, have ERG, d &I employee conferences every year. Uh, this year, we actually had an employee-wide uh, career development conference, and we have numerous speakers coming in. Uh, and these, I think, go a long way in establishing and showing our employees uh, how their engagement and participation uh, is important. And we see that evidence in our surveys. Lastly, I wanna mention that we've launched a boomerang program. And part of that is really in response to the, the great resignation, the competition in the market. And this allows, it's all branded by division as well, but this allows the businesses to go out to sort of high performer, former employees, uh, to talk with them and engage with them and you know, look to uh, get them uh, to consider coming back. And we're launching segments with our ERG so they can play a critical role in influencing, uh, in touching uh, former employees from our diverse dimensions to get them to consider coming back as well. I love that. I, we actually within Oracle have something called a, a relaunch program where we're bringing talent back into Oracle that may have taken taken breaks and opportunities to raise families, um, you know, take care of loved ones. Um, mm -hmm. And as well, when you said the ERG Happy Hour, I think about one of our employee resource groups that also has something what they call is Oracle Latino Alliance, our OLA group that has water cooler uh, Fridays. So, you know, where you would, when you used to be, and they, they created that in this virtual, well, well, we're really remote quite often. Oracle is very remote company, very similar to your device, very remote. But once every, you know, all everyone went to this whole virtual model, they wanted to still have that connection. And so they created the water cooler um, moments. And it was, it's been a really, hit. And to, it, same topic from, just kind of what's going on in our lives, just every day, and to just more critical topics that are top of mind. So I love that, Lisa. Yeah, it's, it's it's really created a, a supportive uh, environment, and and like you, uh, Tracy, it started during the pandemic, and it's continued. And and employees have commented that I don't know what I would do without these sessions because they are quite quite meaningful, uh, can be quite emotional, uh, as I said, depending upon the topic. And quite, you know, informational. So, um, yeah, it's it adds a lot of value uh, to our employees and helps with their engagement, of course. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I I I think it's spot on because regardless of what online system from Teams to Zoom or whatever you're using, just fatigue fell into everyone. So having that 
moment that you could just have a laugh and connect differently was it's such a critical element in that employee experience as well, because people were just overwhelmed with the unknowns. Exactly. And so I, I love it. I love it. Also, one, one thing that we see that really drives employee engagement and, and relates to the diversity, equity, inclusion is, is the connection we do with the wider society. So we have a commitment. Our commitment to DEI is we see that as extending beyond our employees uh, and really contribute to a more equi equitable world. So what we do as well is we partner with high impact partners in the space. Um, and for us, it's, it's about education, STEM education, of course, close to heart for us. So we, we commit to, um, to work with a number of partners in providing um, equitable access to STEM education and opportunities to, to those uh, groups that might not have um, the same level of access as others have. Uh, and that's something that we really see driving our, our people as well to be involved in that and drive that to different things. Great question about what we're doing internally, all right, and, and how we're building that experience. I want to switch this around to the topic of hiring talent and also looking into about promoting talent. You know, can you share some of the insights of what your company is doing as you think about hiring talent, promoting talent, that internal mobility that we know is important for employees to stay and grow with companies. Um, so love to know how you're making sure that even with the hiring, that is equitable, that there's the diversity that's coming in. You know, certainly in the region where you're women in leadership, you know, what, how does that look for your company? Tell us more. Yeah, thank you, Tracy, for the good question. Well, for us, definitely it has been, is an important uh, lever uh, focusing on the challenge, but also not an easy journey because we are in a very traditional industry where if uh, I can share just a number as uh, our job is actually lifting equipment and a uh, uh, lot of service activity, we have a 5% of gender share in the industry, which is really very low. So for us, it really is better to have the talent within the organization and to have diverse talent. But uh, we, have been, we have decided actually uh, to have uh, this statement within our uh, vision. And we have in particular our 40 strategy, which is including uh, uh, transforming, so having the creativity and innovation spirit and sharing ideas, which at the end means talent. And we have the, the trust and the togetherness, and we have the talent part. And when we speak about talent, we speak about the diverse talents. So what we have been doing, uh, uh, where a lot of activities in assuring that we can uh, target our talent pipeline and making mm -hmm. sure that we are exploring all the possible sources to get diverse talent, uh, which is in terms of gender, but not only, because, for example, we are enhancing a lot also aspects like sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability too. And that also has been part of an important project on how to use the language when we go to the job advertisement, how much our language is really inclusive or exclusive for diverse talents. So here we, we have, or we go to the support from some artificial intelligence tool that has helped us to um, reframe our job advertisement but also educating the organization to think when they are creating something to do in a the biased way. And we have also explored other channels or other way to uh, recruit talent, for example, uh, using a blind application too, and making sure again that uh, removing any aspect that is not related to uh, competencies or eventually performances, but not to individual attributes. That has nothing to do actually with hiring. Uh, we could get much more uh, diverse talent. Then is a topic on how to develop them and to allow the, the global mobility. And there, the talent process is very important. So we have a target within a talent process, which include the gender diversity, but also nationality um, and ethnicity diversity. 
uh, we work a lot on the identification, but also on the succession plans. And then, of course, uh, uh, creating a menu of actions that is helping mm -hmm. the people to get to a major job rotation or project activities that allow to be prepared for the next steps. Uh, on uh, our female talent pool, we are working a lot with fast track programs uh, and also with external corporations to make sure and a lot of mentoring programs uh, to make sure that we are creating also the sponsoring and the support within the organization. So uh, we are in the journey. Uh, we start to count good numbers, I need to say, as progression, which means that being systematic make the difference, but definitely you need to be focused on the talent. You need really to be focused with target, with accountability, and with actions that are reflecting that. Right. Excellent. You know, you, you make me reflect back on some things we're doing even internally at Oracle as we, and, and we're a global company, obviously, and in the U.S., um, and we are looking at how we are engaging with historically black colleges and universities, as well as Hispanic serving institutions. And in a real um, intentional way, our executives are engaging with the presidents of the universities and, and they're working with the deans to not be prescriptive, but to be able to share, you know, where you understand better what their needs are and how we can make an impact. So that's one thing I, I made me reflect on. And then, you know, globally, we have a program called Generation O, we call it Gen O. And we are touching non-traditional talent. Um, it started out in LAD, um, it was launched and it was reaching to talent. It was in, specifically in Brazil and engaging Afro-Brazilians um, into uh, the workplace and giving the experience. And, and again, that non-traditional talent that may not have necessarily had a college degree. And we've expanded that to EMEA, where it's including the relaunchers that in there. It is looking at um, early career. And in the US, again, uh, going back to the non-educational degree, because again, if we're looking at how we start to access and be more fairly equitable across uh, the organization, we have to start thinking out the box. I love the work that you're sharing and talking about there, because I think that not, that's the hiring. And then we have the whole development side, but I don't want to, I, I know that I was informed that I, was, I should give some insight, but I, again, I want to be able to hear so much from everyone here um, on this, on this uh, call too, the panelists. But I just do yeah. think I love when companies are doing that. David, please share. Yeah, so I was just thinking as you were talking about uh, this, that this goes right to the heart of the question around a zero-sum game which is that yes. when you hear people talking about yes. uh, diversity in hiring, they think it is because you are going to hire someone because they have a protracted characteristic. That's not what we're talking about here. This is That's about right. expanding the pools that you fish in, actually thinking through what has created those barriers to opportunity, and fundamentally about giving everybody the same opportunity to fulfill their unique potential. Because this isn't about equality in that sense, it's about, mm -hmm. it's about equity of opportunity. And I think this is something that often gets in the way of diversity initiatives, particularly internally. It's the skeptical piece around, well, if you do more on diverse hiring, that is going to reduce my opportunity. It's going to take away an opportunity from the incumbent. And of course, that isn't the case. It's about talking about how you expand where you're looking, how you create mm -hmm. more equitable outcomes, which is what most of us want. Um, but I think it, it's really important that we're able to give the concrete examples of what we are doing, exactly the type of things around how you look in the recruitment pools, how you, how you understand the barriers that exist and break those down such that you have that equity of opportunity. Uh -huh. uh, because I think often when the debate is had, sometimes internally, sometimes with the incumbent groups, there is a huge degree of skepticism. And I think that is something that continues to need to be overcome in, in so many different aspects of uh, the world of work in society and, and many other places. And I was almost wow. delighted to be slightly the subject of that in, in a recent article that I saw in the press where they talk about the role of HR and, and wonder why we are doing this. And I think, you know, it's great that in many respects, HR is, is, is a force for good and uh, a force That's for right. helping to drive equity of opportunity. I really, I really agree what David is saying. I think it's so important to, to, 
really drive it at home. And we do many of the same things that, that you were describing, but you, Mara and Tracy, around the artificial intelligence, around using augmented writing in our in our interview processes. And we also partner with uh, because we because we are fishing for a in a pretty small pool of talent. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of cybersecurity companies out there looking for the same people and. And what we found as well is that there is an enormous pool of untapped talent when you go to the Society of Women Engineers, you go to Blacks in Cybersecurity, you go to the historical Black colleges, universities, and really working with um, going to same thing. We, we, we go to military bases and recruit from because right. they will have a very highly skilled talent pool that are coming out of the army at some point, and they, then they're looking for jobs in, in, and we can offer them a lot of that. Um, and the other thing we've, we've really found is, and I bring back the internship program, because we see that a way of getting really diverse talent in is looking at those coming out of university in the next couple of years. So over the last two years, we, we've quadrupled the number of people we've taken on. And we, we've been very heavily partnering closely with historically black college universities, with, with the Society of Women Engineers, um, to find that outstanding rising talent. And it's been really successful. So uh, we we have interns who really love the program. Uh, unanimously, they re- agree that they were recommended to internship to friends. And uh, a vast majority of those that we've had here doing internships as well are now working with us or will be working with us in the next couple of months. So it's a great way of bringing more people in. You know, I I, I, I would definitely want to just add a little bit on to Tobias. You talked about veterans and that's you know, in the U.S., that's really our focus in the, in the veteran community. We created something called the Oracle Veteran Internship Program. Um, it's, it's a 10-week program, experiential. Um, it's professional development. We align them to other veterans within um, the company. But the talent has been so strong that up to 70% have been transitioned into full-time hires. Two years ago, we added in military spouses, right? Because they're traveling all around with their loved ones. And, you know, giving them the opportunities as well. We placed permanently um, our uh, the military spouses and we're doubling. It was two ro- rotations twice a year of 20. And this year, and our, our fiscal year just started, we're increasing, we're doubling it, um, 20 each pro- each uh, rotation, just to make a higher impact. So that your, your spot on the veterans is critical about this. Eric, I, I want to pull you in a bit. I, I know we heard from David and, and everyone, you just had a few moments to speak, but... I want to get to how do we get that buy-in, right? Our executives starting from the top and how we bed diversity and inclusion. Data has shown that's critical and important, that our leaders are talking about it, that it starts from the top so that it could trickle down an organization. Tell me how you're securing buy-in and the sponsorship from senior executives um, and engaging them on this DNI journey, because it's truly a journey. Absolutely, Tracy. <laughs> you are right. This is a real journey. And what, what we do is you know, we have created what we so call a DAI council, which is made of uh, part of the executive management team members. And uh, four of them uh, belong to this uh, executive uh, DNI council. And their role is really, well, to validate, of course, the strategy, the directions, and to provide also budget means in order that um, this is um, becoming life across the organization. And also, well, we are not there yet, but we are reflecting, of course, by creating also future employee resource groups um, that sh- they should also sponsor. Each of them should sponsor also one of um, this uh, employee resource group. So this is one way that uh, we, we involve definitely executive management team into it. And our CEO also, every time, of course, uh, we do have also leadership team calls, uh, but also meetings. Uh, this is, is spreading also the word on it and what believes into it as well. So, so this is really coming from, from the top. And then, of, well, we are a big matrix organization, and then it has to go through the funnel. Because, of course, in order to make it happen, this is not only the CEO on this executive DNI concern, but then we do have business unit, global unit, and then we utilize also their leadership team also to go through and the, the global ambitions that we do have on DNI, meaning on gender, meaning on underrepresented groups, meaning also on inclusive leadership. So they translate it also. What does it mean in terms of their global units or their business units, how do they cast this, uh, these ambitions? 
And last but not least, of course, so this is, this is still on regional level. And then when we go to, to the local, meaning the, the countries, in the countries also, we do have also what we call country management teams. And then this is also their role. We engage them also by creating awareness at this level, but also they've gotten the responsibility in order to translate it into also local actions and local activities by uh, as well on creating focus groups locally to engage on the different topics, um, but also to create uh, also the, the, these activities and especially also on the recruitment because the recruitment is, is quite uh, local from the majority of our workforce. We are a big manufacturing organization. And so also what does it mean uh, in order to attract uh, and look at us people operators in our factories also and that we want also so to expand uh, uh, the, the diversity, but not, uh, not only also the diversity of thinking, which is also so very mm -hmm. important into our approach. So to make it short, yes, uh, big in involvement, of course, from the top. And then uh, this is quite a cascading process in order to ensure that uh, at different levels in the organization, uh, there is uh, a true commitment and a true engagement uh, when it comes to d and uh, ambition. Again, looking at, I love the diversity of thought. That's incredibly important. That diversity of thought, those different dimensions of diversity, if we're not leveraging it, that's what increases leadership innovation. So I, I really I like that. As a, well, a pretty recent parent, my, my kids are four and two. I mean, one of the things I've learned as well is while encouragement is really important, boundary setting is equally important, if not, if not even more. And I think that's something that really comes in with this executive teams as well, that really showing what's not accepted as well. So it's one thing encouraging and driving and, and, and building from it, but also being really clear that we have a zero tolerance. Non-inclusive behavior is not, not accepted at all. One of our core values that we say is we win as a team, which means we don't have time for prima donnas or egos that take up too much space in the room. And if you, if you have that, you actually have to find somewhere else to work because we work as a team, we win as a team, and that means that we include and everybody's included. Everybody should be belonging there as well. And, and if you can't, if you can't accept that, the one thing we will not be diverse on is our values. Let's put it that way. So. I like that's There's a, there's a line in the sand on the values. I, I, I think that's so incredibly important that you stick to the values. They're important to how you think about your business and your commitment to your employees and out there to your customers as well. So that's, that's important. Uh, David is, you know, I want to ask you about self-identification and and how is that being created in, in the workplace? And 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 when you gather this data, how are you using it to measure your inclusive culture within your organization, satisfaction of the employees? Yeah, sure. So um, self-identification is something that we've uh, we're embarking on across a number of countries. We've had self-identification on the basis of race and ethnicity in the US and the UK for, for a while. But I mentioned earlier, we have a, a powering lives ambition as part of our strategy and our four focus areas there are gender identity, sexual orientation, disability and race and ethnicity. And so we're now rolling out across 10 countries with more to come. Um, and just for a level set, what self-identification is, is the opportunity for individuals to voluntarily disclose this information such that that data can be correlated against other HR processes. So opposed to an anonymous survey, this actually gives you an insight into the experiences of those individuals, those diverse groups. So it allows you to understand how different diverse groups, for example, experience performance, access to uh, promotions, learning, a whole host of things. So this really gets to the heart of equity and inclusion. So yes, of course, it helps you to understand your representation, albeit that, of course, you need the amount of disclosure to be statistically relevant for that to be really good for reporting purposes. But even the statistical uh, uh, significant pieces, that can really help you to understand equity. Uh, and so therefore, it's not just about the minority groups, it's about everyone. This is not without risk, of course, because people, this is personal sensitive data. This is stuff you really need to uh, put your arms around, think about just who's going to have access to it. And unless people think you are treating it sensitively, they will not disclose. That's not just our experience. It's the experience of other companies out there. We've learned from people that have gone before us, Google, LinkedIn, others, et cetera. 
Um, and I think um, the, the, the challenge here is you need to think global and act local. So you should only uh, allow those fields to be uh, self-identification on fields that are culturally and legally appropriate in the markets in which you're operating in. That's, of course, very important. You need to explain that this is not a zero sum game. This is uh, you know, what you're going to use the data for. Um, and it really is coming back to this piece around really understanding unique people and how they are powerful together. Um, and so I think from, a, from an ability to use the data, it helps us to understand representation. It helps us to do all the things that we've talked about in terms of thinking about how you expand the pipeline. But it's also about the experience in processes and the behaviors around, hey, why, did, why haven't certain people got the same performance outcomes? It's often not because the process isn't right, it's because the work hasn't been distributed equally. And that's a very different conversation. And the ability to then pull across the experience of these diverse groups across a range of processes and say, hey, it's not just this one, which you'd like to rationalize away, but it's consistent and it's in this department. That's a very different uh, conversation, which helps to think about where you want to go as an organization. But as I say, you need to, you need to really think through data privacy. You need to be really transparent on, on what you are going to use the data for. Really clear you're not using it in individual hiring and selection decisions, because otherwise people won't give it to you. And you need to recognize that this is the type of data that um, you know, needs to be really carefully thought through, because every time the world goes to the extremes, these are very groups of people who either experience increased discrimination, they are segregated, they are persecuted and at the very worst exterminated. And so, you know, this is right at the heart of some of the things that society has struggled with. Mm -hmm. And we know that, you know, talent may be equally distributed, opportunity isn't. But we also know that when people come together on a common cause and over a period of time united in that common cause, you can make progress. So it's, it's the start of a journey. It will take time with representation, analysis, quantitative and qualitatively. And in terms of experience, we separate that from self ID. We continue to have our people survey to monitor that. Of course, at a certain point, we'll be able to correlate those experiences, um, at least, but on an anonymized and a, a an aggregate basis. We will never do it at the individual level, and that is our that's our commitment to our employees as well. I think that's really is important how you're looking at it from the equity and how you're engaging talent, how you're having conversations with talent. I will tell you, we have three minutes, just three minutes left on this panel. I told you everyone, this was going to be a rich conversation. So I, I have to go to my final question. It, I would be just remiss if I didn't. I would love for you quickly in three minutes to share just one piece of parting advice a golden nugget to leave of everyone of what they could do today, not tomorrow. What can you do in this next moment to make a difference, to expand diversity and inclusion? Eric, I want to, I want to go to you first and just have you share. And we have three minutes, everyone. Well, to, to, to me, to me, the best, my, my recommendation is definitely, as I said before, it's super important to involve leadership into it from the top right to the bottom. So this is, if you want to start, get full engagement from your top leaders, and then definitely this will help the way forward. Thank you. Mara, please. Yeah, and I build on what Eric said, uh, engagement is important. And I see from the top leaders, but also from the entire organization. So find and use the intrinsic motivation that people have using the right argumentation really to move diversity, equity, and inclusion. Everybody has one. You need to capture what is important for them. Excellent. Tobias. You know, I'm going to build on the same thing, really. It's about leadership for us, which is one of the things we do is, is put together specific leadership courses to ensure that all of our managers really are given the tools to adapt their management style to fit the needs of a diverse team. Um, so don't manage everybody the same way. David, please. So I would say be aspirational and values driven. Be humble, transparent and open around what you're doing. Um, and don't duck the difficult issues, but be prepared to take time and persistence in tackling them. Lisa, we'll close with you. Closing with me, uh, building on what everyone has said, I would add, be a lifelong learner because that helps you um, better engage, I think. And also don't be afraid to fail. Um, I think all of us have encountered 
uh, various initiatives, projects, and have some stumbles, that's okay. Uh, apply some lessons, lessons learned and keep progressing. My, my quick tip would just certainly to remind everyone, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It takes time to put these processes in place. And I encourage everyone to take away some of these great nuggets and insight that were shared and understand how that fits into your organization. And with that, I just want to thank these amazing panelists for your insights, your input, the value that you shared here today. I, I hope that everyone walks away with something that they could think about how they implement into their organization.